So I mentioned at the beginning of the chapter that Unit 6 is probably the most difficult unit of the entire class. And the reason for that, or one of the reasons, is because each section is kind of like its own different thing, combining the concepts of random variables. In 6.1, we focused on what a random variable was, and then we figured out how to find the mean and the standard deviation of a random variable. In section 6.2, we're going to learn how you can manipulate a random variable and then look at what that does to your mean and standard deviation for the new result. And this section, 6.2, is broke up into two different pieces. We have 6.2a, which talks about transforming random variables, and 6.2b, which talks about combining different random variables. And the rules even for each of these little lessons here are different. So you have to be able to keep these two contexts straight, which can be a little bit challenging to do. So let's go ahead and talk about an example here. So we have a fictional community college, and at this community college, we you're allowed to take anywhere between 12 and 18 credit hours. Your typical class in college is a three credit hour class. Some can be four or five or even a little less, two or one. But to be considered a full-time student in most places, you have to be between 12 and 18 credit hours. And then based on the number of students who have each of those number of credit hours there, we have the probability breakdown if you pick a kid at random that they're going to have this many credits. So we define our random variable x to be the number of credits that a full-time student has. So you can see that x can be anywhere between 12 and 18. It's a discrete random variable. And you can see the breakdown of what's the most popular at this university. They ask us to calculate and interpret the mean and the standard deviation of this probability distribution. And this part right here is just straight up review of what we learned last section. So you could use your formulas, which we have practiced, and you could get your results that way, but I'm going to opt to use the calculator instead and just type it in. So we re reviewed that as well. Remember that all you're going to do with this is go stat edit and type your data in. And then once that data is in the calculator, you are going to go ahead and do a one variable stats. So I'm going to pull that up on my screen here. All right, I got my data typed in. And um, once you type in your data, you're going to go to calc. It's a one variable stats. And remember that when you do a probability distribution, you do want a frequency list. It's your probabilities, which I have an L2. And then if I hit calculate, it's going to generate me a bunch of stuff right here. The two I care about right now are my mean, which it reports on the top line right here, 14.65, and my standard deviation. If this was a quiz question, you would need to show me some work on both of those. But for the purposes of this lesson right here, I'm just going to go ahead and copy those down. So my mean in this problem was a 14.65. And that we already have the variable x for this one. So I'm going to say mu of x is 14.65. And the standard deviation on that same data set was a 2.06 if I round that. So 2.06 for my standard deviation. It also asked us to interpret our standard deviation and our mean in this problem. So this would be a great chance to pause the video and try that out for yourself. But let's talk about what they mean and I'll pop up a little written explanation as well. Remember the idea with the mean is that you have to have many trials. It's the long run average in a problem. So if I were to randomly select many different students from this community college and average how many credits each of them have, it would average out to be 14.65. Remember, we do not round the expected value. We also, um, it doesn't have to be one of the numbers from the problem. So we can get a decimal and that's totally okay. The standard deviation talks about if you have a randomly selected students, we would expect their credit hours to vary by about 2.06 from the mean of 14.65. And I'll write out a little explanation for each of those and then we'll move on. All right, so you guys can see just a nice little written up explanation there for how we would interpret each of those things. This is basically section 6.1 in review right there. So what we're going to do is take our table right there that they gave us, our original probability distribution. And we're gonna look at what happens when we transform that table of data. 
By a transformation, I mean taking our numbers and either adding, subtracting, or multiplying, dividing by a constant. So let's see how that plays out in the next slide. So what's going to happen now is instead of just looking at the number of credit hours themselves, we are instead going to choose to look at the tuition that is charged to the students, and they're charged at this school a really good deal, a rate of $50 per credit unit. So basically, we had our own old random variable x, which is just credit hours. Our new variable t is going to equal 50 times x, $50 per credit hour. And we're going to look instead at how much tuition we charge them instead of the um, actual number of credits. So you'll see the probabilities here did not change. These probabilities correspond to what we were just talking about. So they're the same numbers there. But the cost is going to be what we care about now up here. So we're going to find the mean and standard deviation for this problem. And I'm going to show you guys a nice little trick you can use here on your calculators. When you go stats, edit. You could just type in this whole list of numbers again, and that would be fine. But what you can also do is go up to the very top in your next column over. So I'm going to use L3 right here. And up in the very top, I can type in a little formula for what I want it to do. And what I want to do here is take 50 times whatever number was in L1. So second one. And if I do 50 times L1, it's like a little formula like this. If I hit enter, it'll populate that list with the numbers that I care about already. So I don't have to type it in from scratch, which is kind of nice. So when I do this now, I'm going to go quit out and go to stats, calc, one variable stats. This time, the list of numbers I care about is my L3. That's where I put my new numbers. My probabilities are still in L2. And I'm going to go ahead and calculate that. And when I do that, my mean is a 732.5. So I'm going to write that down, mean 732.5. And this is T, oops. This is T for my problem right here. So mu sub T is 732.5. For reference, my old mean was going to be 14.65. Oh, it's my cat. Um, sorry. So I got 14.65 and then I've also got my standard deviation going on. So my old standard deviation for X was 2.06. And that means my new standard deviation, if I look at what it was, is a 102.80. So 102.80 is going to be my new standard deviation. All right, so I'm not gonna bother writing out an inter interpretation for both of these because it's basically the same sort of idea. So you guys can do that if you want, but instead I wanna look at how we got from our old mean and standard deviation to our new mean and standard deviation. And if you look at this problem right here, this number, that 14.65, if you multiply it by 50, you get the new mean written right here. This standard deviation, if you multiply it by 50, you're going to get your new standard deviation right over here. So all you do, if you have an old variable and you already know the stats on it, you can just take those numbers and multiply them or divide them by that same number, and you're going to get your new mean and standard deviation. That's all you have to do. So what is the effect of multiplying or dividing a random variable by a constant? Both the mean and the standard deviation get multiplied or divided by the same number. So it's a pretty straightforward trick that you can use right here. So you don't have to type it all in the calculator or do your calculations. All that happens is we multiplied the mean and the standard deviation by that same thing, okay? So that is multiplication and division. Let's move on and talk about addition and subtraction. So the last slide, we had your tuition charge just for the straight up credit hours. But it turns out there's also going to be a $100 registration fee or something like that that you have to pay as well. So C is another new random variable that we're establishing where it's going to be your old variable T, the tuition cost, plus $100. And they give us the new numbers. Probability still didn't change.
So what I'm going to do right now is I am going to go to L4 in this problem. And for L4, I'm going to take L3 and I'm going to add 100 to it. So it will populate my new numbers right here. And now I'm going to look at my stats. So I do another one variable stats. This time I care about L4. And here we go. So my mean for the old stuff, transferring over what I just got. For T, the variable I just got done with, I had 732.5. And I forget what the standard deviation was. It was like 102.5, I think. I'm going to leave that part blank for now. And then I'm going to write down my new statistics as well, 102.8. So it's 832.5, and it's a 102.8. So those are my old stats. And my new variable right here, mu of C, is 832.5. And standard deviation for C is the same, 102.8. So from the mean, when I added 100 onto my random variable, I already knew t. I added 100 to that to get c. The mean gets 100 added on. Easy. The standard deviation, though, does not change. We actually saw this really early on in class. I think it was chapter one. Measures of spread. If I add something to all my points, my points are like right here, and I add 100 to all of them, what that does is it shifts the whole list over, but it doesn't change how spread my arms are right here. It just shifts everything equally. So adding and subtracting a constant does not affect measures of spread. So what is the effect of adding or subtracting a constant? Mean you're going to add or subtract that same constant. Standard deviation is going to stay the same. So standard deviation stays the same. And that is the big key. You can see that it works. We've done an example. I've explained logically like this why it works. But you need to be able to keep that straight. All the time in problems, kids will go too fast and just autopilot. They'll add on to the standard deviation as well. And that is wrong. So don't do that. So this slide right here just restates the main rules we're talking about. When you talk about linear transformations, linear transformations means add, subtract, multiply, divide by a constant, by just a plain number. And they'll write it in this format. X is our old variable. You can multiply by something or divide by something B and add or subtract something A to it right here. So this is fancy math speak, but you can see it's just saying the same thing we used to. The mean does exactly what you would think it would. You add or subtract, you multiply or divide, you just do everything like you would guess before you took AP stats and you would be right. The standard deviation, on the other hand, only accounts for the multiplication and division. That's the only thing that will affect it here. And you cannot have a negative standard deviation. So if you multiply by a negative number, you take the absolute value to get your new answers. There's a few other notes here on the bottom that you guys can read. But when we look at these sorts of problems here, these rules that I just showed you guys apply to both discrete and continuous random variables. So the same rules apply in both situations. So let's finish off with a little example here. All right, in our problem, we are looking at a set of test scores right here. Um, it doesn't say how many points the test was out of, but I don't know, maybe 20 or something like that. Uh, it couldn't be 20, actually. I don't know what it's out of. But the mean of everybody's raw scores, so 20-something point test, the mean is 17.2, and the standard deviation is 3.8. And the professor establishes a random variable, x, which is going to be the raw scores uh, of a student on a test. All right. So the professor has this info for the mean and standard deviation of the raw scores out of 20 something. But they want to take this test and they want to put it out of 100. So in order to do that, they decide they're going to multiply the scores by four and add 10. Now you could sit there and you could take each kid's score times four plus 10 times four plus 10. And that would be cool. You could find the new mean and the new standard deviation of your data set that way. You could like if you had that data, you could. We don't have that but we don't need it either. 
It is going to take a new random variable and they define y to be your scaled score. First of all, if I was gonna write out a little formula here, I'm multiplying my old scores by four and then I'm gonna add 10 onto them. And they want to know the new mean and the new standard deviation for y, given that we have this info for x. So let's do the mean first. The mean is great. The mean is our friend. It works exactly like we would think it would. You're just going to take the old mean times four, and then you're going to add 10 after that. You just do what common sense says to do. So if I actually get that set up right there, nice and simple calculations, I'm just going to do my four times my 17.2, and I'm going to add on 10. And when I do that, my new mean is 78.8. Nice, easy, simple. That is all you do. All right, so that was cool. The standard deviation, on the other hand, when we're going to get the standard deviation for y, this 4 right here, the multiplication, is going to matter. The plus 10 is not going to affect my standard deviation at all. So all I'm going to do is take 4 times my old standard deviation. And if you do that, I believe that's a 15.2. So the plus 10 didn't do anything. All right, last question for this video. It says, what is the probability that a randomly selected student has a scaled test score of greater than 90? And at first, it doesn't feel like they gave us enough information to do this problem. There's no table we can look at. There's nothing else going on. But they slipped in this problem that the distribution of scores, raw scores, is normal or approximately normal. So if the raw scores are approximately normal, we learned back in chapter one, when you add, subtract, multiply, or divide by a constant, that does not affect the shape of your graph. So your new graph for y is also going to be normal, even though they didn't tell us that. So y is also normal. Because it's a linear transformation of x. All right, and then it's just easy. We're going to set up a little normal CDF like we like to do. Our mean that we calculated for y is a 78.8. Our standard deviation is a 15.2. And I want to know greater than 90. So I'm looking for this area right here. I know it's going to be a smaller area when I set this up. So I would just do a normal CDF with a lower of 90 an upper of a big number, a mean of 78.8, and a standard deviation of 15.2. And if I actually calculate that real fast, normal CDF, my, oops, my 90 for my lower, 78.8, 15.2, it looks like the probability of that happening will be just over 23%. So 0 0.2306 is going to be my probability. And again, I don't have space or time to do it in this video, but if this was like a quiz question or something like that, just make sure you restate the problem in context. The probability that a randomly selected scaled score will be greater than 90 is approximately 23%. So that is how you transform a linear um do linear transformations on a random variable. The next video, we're going to talk about combining random variables, and the rules for that are different.